So in this video, we're going to talk more about fluid dynamics and starting with some of the fundamentals and namely the two main types of flow of fluids. We have laminar flow and we have turbulent flow. So let's break these down one at a time. In laminar flow, fluids move in smooth parallel layers with minimal mixing. And laminar flow is more common in high viscosity fluids, which we'll talk more about just shortly, or under low velocity conditions. And this makes them more predictable and more energy efficient. So we can see an illustration of laminar flow here on the right, where again we can see that smooth parallel layer that's flowing within this pipe. Now, again, we'll leave viscosity to the side for the moment, but if we consider why low velocity conditions are more common to have laminar flow, well, this makes sense because the faster it moves, the less likely we're going to have this ordered, smooth movement. Things will get more chaotic and more difficult to control at higher speeds. Now, laminar flow is essentially the opposite of turbulent flow. And in turbulent flow, fluid movement is chaotic and irregular with eddies, so essentially small whirlpools of fluid motion, and mixing of layers. And as we've just discussed, turbulent flow is more likely at higher velocities or in low viscosity fluids. And therefore, they are more energy intensive and they are less predictable. And we can see what turbulent flow might look like in the same pipe. Again, we no longer have these smooth parallel layers, but we have a bunch of chaotic motion in all different directions. We have eddies. It's very different than laminar flow. It's far more chaotic. So the summary is that laminar flow is smooth and orderly and turbulent flow is chaotic and mixed. So how do we know whether or not a fluid is going to experience laminar flow or turbulent flow? Well, one way is to simply give it a try, but if we're designing something, we can't simply give every possible option a try. We need to be able to predict and in fact guarantee the type of flow. So for this, we have the Reynolds number. And the Reynolds number is a dimensionless number that's used to predict whether fluid flow is laminar or turbulent. Now, to determine the Reynolds number, we can use the following expression. So we have R sub E, which is the Reynolds number, is equal to the product of rho, which is the fluid density, U, which is the flow speed, and L, the characteristic length. Again, this is a product. And this product will all be divided by mu, which is the dynamic viscosity. Now, depending on the number, the dimensionless number that comes as a consequence of this calculation, you can determine the type of flow. And you can do so by referring to a few different thresholds. So for laminar flow, the Reynolds number will be less than approximately 2000. Some of these thresholds will vary. You'll see them expressed slightly differently. Sometimes the laminar flow is said to be below a Reynolds number of 2100, but more or less, the Reynolds number less than 2000 is considered laminar flow. Now, for turbulent flow, the Reynolds number is said to be greater than approximately 4000. And then there's actually a third case. There's something called transitional flow, where you have some contribution from each type. And this is typically between the 2000 and 4000 number. Now, if it's not self-evident, the Reynolds number helps engineers design systems by predicting flow types, which is crucial for optimizing things like pipelines, vehicles, hydraulic systems, and much, much more. The Reynolds number is fundamental to fluid dynamics. So we keep hearing of this term viscosity, and that's because it is indeed very important to fluid dynamics. So it's important that we understand it. So viscosity is a fluid's resistance to flow, or in other words, it can be considered as a measure of internal friction. So if we have a high viscosity fluid, well then we have a fluid that will flow more slowly. And we can think of honey and oil as two common examples of highly viscous fluids. Oppositely, we have low viscosity fluids, which oppositely flow more easily. So two common and probably obvious examples include water in the case of a liquid and air in the case of a gas. Now, therefore, high viscosity fluids or high viscosity promotes 
laminar flow, while low viscosity promotes or allows turbulent flow and at higher speeds. So let's think through this again, just as we did the case of velocity. Well, if the viscosity is essentially resistance, and high viscosity means more internal friction, more internal resistance, well then this will bring things under control. It can't get to as high of speeds, and less chaos is possible because there's less flexibility in the system. Now if we compare this to low viscosity, which again allows for turbulent flow, well again it's less resistance. So higher speeds are more obtainable, and there's less resistance to essentially stop chaos from emerging, more complex motion. The more controlled the system is, well, the more likely it is to lean towards laminar flow. But if there's many different things that's going to promote different types of motion in different regions of the fluid, well, then it's going to promote turbulent flow. Now, there's another thing to consider, which is the role of temperature on viscosity, and therefore the temperature's effect on fluid dynamics. So for liquids, this is something we're probably all familiar, even if you don't know it, for liquids, the temperature dependence is such that viscosity decreases as temperature increases. And the reason I say we all know this, but may not know it, is we can think of things like warming some honey and some tea. What will happen? It will get less viscous. It will go from being very, very thick to much less thick. It will become closer to what we would expect from something like water. Now for gases, this is interestingly actually the opposite. So as temperature increases, the viscosity also increases. Now this may be a little bit more counterintuitive, but it ultimately has to do with the gas molecules gaining more kinetic energy as they increase in temperature. That is in fact the meaning of an increase in temperature, which leads to more frequent collisions between molecules, and in turn, this increases the momentum transfer. And the result is we get thicker gases effectively. We get gases with more internal friction, greater resistance. So let's talk about another fundamental principle of fluid dynamics, which is Bernoulli's principle. And Bernoulli's principle states that as fluid velocity increases, the pressure decreases. And the Bernoulli principle extends to what's called the Bernoulli equation, which gives the total pressure of an incompressible fluid with three terms. So we have the first term, which is what's called the static head, which we can think of as the pressure energy. And this is plus the second term, which is called the dynamic head, and that represents the kinetic energy from motion. And that might be obvious by taking a closer look at this term, because it resembles that of the equation for kinetic energy, one half mv squared. Then those two terms are summed with the third and final term, which is rho times g times h. And this term is called the elevation head because it represents the potential energy from a fluid's elevation. Now together again, these sum to give the total pressure of the fluid. But why is this important? Well, of course these have many very important applications for everyday life, and in fact some of our more sophisticated and modern innovations, with one example being an airplane. So in an airplane, faster air travels over the curved top of the wing is what reduces pressure to generate lift. So this is fundamental for flight. No lift, no flight. Then we're on to something that's very interesting called the Venturi effect. And the Venturi effect is essentially when you have constricted motion, constricted area for a fluid to move, well then you're going to see an increase in velocity and a decrease in pressure. And again, this is Bernoulli's principle in action. So we can see one such example of the Venturi effect here. We have a pipe which is at some thickness before constricting to a smaller cross-sectional area and then returning to the original cross-sectional area. So going from this region of the pipe to this constricted region, we will see an increase in velocity and a decrease in pressure. And then again, when we return back to the original cross-sectional area, well then the velocity will return to its original, so that is a decrease from the velocity in the constricted area, and the pressure will increase. So we covered a lot in this lesson, so let's review some of the most important information. First of all, we have two main types of flow. We have laminar flow, 
and we have turbulent flow. And laminar flow is smooth and orderly, whereas turbulent flow is chaotic and mixed. To predict whether flow will be laminar or turbulent, we can use the Reynolds number, which is the dimensionless number that is, of course, used to predict whether fluid flow is laminar or turbulent. And to calculate or determine the Reynolds number, we can use this expression. Then we moved on to a discussion about viscosity, which is a fluid's resistance to flow, or in other words, a measure of internal friction. And we said that high viscosity fluids are thicker, they more resistant, they will flow more slowly and with more effort, and the opposite is true of low viscosity. A low viscosity fluid will flow more easily because it has less internal resistance. Then we continued our conversation to the Bernoulli principle, which says that as fluid velocity increases, pressure decreases. And then we also covered the Bernoulli equation, which has three terms. We have the static head, we have the dynamic head, and lastly, we have the elevation head. And the sum of these three terms will come together to calculate the total pressure.